Okay, this is DSD for the uh, 12, uh, let's see, no, 9, 12, 13, 14, for the 14th of uh, September. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's lecture 9, I believe. Uh, in any event, this is the beginning of the review of logic design. So we're going to go through this fairly quickly because you all have taken this course. I think probably all of you had me as an instructor. And um, so hopefully this should be familiar to you. And hopefully this will jog your brain and, uh, and you'll be good. Because you are going to need uh, your logic design skills for DSD. Uh, don't need them much for micro, but you do need them for DSD. And so we're, we're going to go through that and hopefully that will be helpful. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. I'm going to turn this off. Okay. Very good. That was a little glary. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, uh, so let me just look at the syllabus real quickly here, and uh, it is here, and we'll scroll down to where we have the schedule. So you can see, uh, so we have, uh, we have uh, starting on, well, we should have started on Friday, but we didn't quite get to it, but we have uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, and then a test on Wednesday on the 23rd over logic design. So uh, that's how that's how that's planned to be. Um, let's see. Oh, I, let me just check too. I will. Uh, so uh, homework three is due on Monday, and homework four is due on the following Monday. So keep those in mind. Uh, I did get one question on homework three. Uh, wanted to know how you could how the test bench could report errors unless he ran it on Vivado. So uh, that was kind of taken a little bit too literally. Uh, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to write a module that counts uh, a, a, a a certain sequence. Remember we did this in Logic Design, and I'll go over that today. <clears throat> That'll help you get that homework done. And then uh, you need to write a test bench to test the module to see if it uh, uh, you put in the clock and then you get back the count sequence and you should check the count sequence with the what should be the proper sequence and if it's correct great and if it's not it should report an error that's how the test bench should work but you don't have to run it to write that you can write the test bench just fine now if you want to if you want to put it in Vivado and verify it that's great uh, I'm all for that but I didn't uh, that's not part of the homework we will however do a lab uh, or maybe we'll do a uh, a practicum like that where you do have to do that and I'll give everybody their own personal sequence and then you have to generate it and take a video of it counting the sequence um, so it's actually pretty easy to do uh, especially especially with an FPGA chip because you, uh, but what will be interesting I'll show you several different ways of doing it um, and of course one way is just to dump it out of a ROM in fact that's probably the easiest way uh, where you just um, create a loop and it just spits out the correct uh, sequence and that's all there is to it okay let me uh, <clears throat> let me shrink this down um, I'm still trying to get things sorted out so so it actually you know so it looks good and is helpful I don't know I'll put it let's see it here we'll see how this works all right um, and so I'll, I'll <clears throat> Yeah, so I'll come back to this homework later on. All right, so let me uh, let me just start. We'll see if we can make some good progress on the uh, uh, getting through the the material. All right, so and here we are. Okay, so so remember, you do need to understand definition of digital versus analog. Uh, basically, a, a digital signal is a signal that's quantized. It it you create some number of bins based on the number of bits set aside. So if you have 8 bits, then you have 256 bins. And if you have uh, 32 bits, you have 4 billion bins. But whatever it is, that's the number of bins you've got. And your your signal has to fall into one of the bins. And there's no such thing as a signal being between two bins. Uh, in the digital world, it has to fall into one of the bins. In the analog world, of course, the signal can vary. The, the actual value of the signal can vary continuously again within some range but the problem is uh, is noise and your and your ability to and, and the precision with which you can read that uh, and that's oftentimes uh, 
limited. And the noise especially, uh, because the noise itself uh, may be, may be uh, uh, fairly significant, uh, it will limit your ability to read with precision the, uh, the signal you're trying to read. And so, th so then you will be, um, you will be limited. Uh, so no matter what you do in the analog world, the, the noise always becomes a big problem. Now, we have noise in the digital world, too. The noise occurs on the front end. Uh, and uh, when we build a device, we normally have what we call an AFE, an analog front end, that acquires the signal. And most signals are uh, acquired by sensors that generate either uh, uh, current values or, or voltage values a, as part of that signal. And then we digitize that information. Once we digitize it, uh, if we choose to invest the time and effort and the resources, we can virtually guarantee that that, that, that digitized value will never be uh, corrupted, that we will, we will always be able to preserve uh, the, that precise digital value that we, pr that we created with our analog digital uh, conversion right there at the beginning. Now, uh, uh, when you do the conversion, of course, that's the time when you define how many bits of, uh, 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 how many, how, well, how many bins you put that signal in, which it basically uh, defines your precision at that point. And, and, and you can have a fairly arbitrary level of precision, but of course you, you have to be aware of the fact that your noise is also converted in that process. And, uh, and if the noise, if you don't want to try and push the precision so that all your, so that you're, so that you're really measuring a bunch of noise. Um, and part of the problem, part of the, part of the, the push in the digital world has been to do that conversion as close to the sensor as possible. Because the, the quicker we do the conversion as close to the sensor as possible, the more likely uh, that there'll be less opportunity to have that uh, original measurement be corrupted by noise. But again, once you, once you convert it to the digital world, assuming you use adequate number of bits, uh, then, uh, then, then you can take steps to preserve that signal in its in its in in its in that initial form, so that it will never be corrupted, and uh, it's not that difficult to do. Uh, now, of course, if the system crashes, you can lose data. I mean, obviously there are things, but that's why we have, you know, backups. That's why we have off-site backups. Uh, industries that have had their uh, their data stolen and then encrypted, and then they have to you know pay the ransomware fee to get it back. They didn't have off-site backups because if they had, uh, then they would have been able to tell them to go pound sand. They would have fixed their uh, their their insecurities in their uh, in their firewall, and then they would have uh, re restored their computers and wouldn't have lost more than a day's worth of work. Now that still could be significant, and maybe maybe within that context, um, it might be worth paying the ransom. I don't know, but but. Uh, but, but hopefully you wouldn't have to lose more than one day. And if you did backups twice a day, you could, you could maybe only lose uh, half a day. And obviously you maintain several days worth of backups. So if, you, if one of your backups is corrupted somehow, then you can always back up just a little further. And, and again, offsite, because if your facility burns to the ground, uh, it may destroy your, all your backups. So you want them actually to be in a physically separate location. And there's a whole science of data security and whatnot. I, that we're really I'm getting far afield. All right. So anyway, so examples, a digital thermometer, digital speedometer. But of course, um, many of the, especially with a digital thermometer, we're typically using a, a, a temperature sensor that produces a voltage proportional to temperature. Um, all right. So quantized, that's the key. Or you can think of it in terms of fitting the signal into, in, into one of a number of bins. And your precision depends on how many bins you have. But if your noise is such that, that, that you, you really couldn't tell within 10 or 20 bins which, which bin it should be in because of the noise, then you probably have too many bins. Um, so there's no reason to have excess bins. OK, uh, analog, obviously. We talked about this already, varies continuously over a range of values, but we're always limited by our ability to read it. And so here's a good example. Here's a pressure gauge.
how, how accurately can you read this pressure gauge? Well, the answer is not that accurately, actually. I mean, you know, it, uh, it's, it's, uh, each one of these bits is 2 PSI. That's 10, 20, 30, 40. And uh, so you can probably read it maybe to plus or minus a PSI, but you sure can't read it to plus or minus 0.1 PSI. And so here you've got three figures. So you could, you could, you know, read this to three figures. Here you, you can read it to, well, two figures, really. All right. Uh, same thing here. How accurately can you read this? Here you can read it to a tenth of a degree C quite easily. Now, is it, is it that accurate? It, it may not be that accurate. It may be plus or minus a degree, depending on the precision of the temperature sensor used out here at the tip. Many of these temperature sensors are plus or minus one degree C. So this tenth of a degree is a little bit of a... Um, a, a, an illusion because you're not really you know because your actual sensor is not that accurate you're saying that you can that this is 37.0 but actually if the sensor is plus or minus one degree this real reading could be uh, 36.0 uh, to uh, 38.0 and so that that point zero doesn't mean much really um, but uh, but you can invest and get better sensors, and maybe that is correct. I don't know, but probably not, actually, in this case. However, you could make the argument that, uh, that if you do me two measurements in a row and you see a change in, in you know, say, 0.5 degrees, that may be real, uh, even though the precision is not that good, uh, but just the fact that uh, even though the temperature sensor may be miscalibrated, uh, its accuracy may be off plus or minus one degree, uh, it, it, its precision may be a tenth of a degree, which means that, that you're detecting a, a half a degree change, but or even a tenth of a degree change, but it's just the wrong number. Okay, and that goes back to precision and accuracy. We won't get into it. Well, we will, actually, in a minute. All right, there, there's all sorts of advantages to digital. I think you, you all probably know a lot of this. The really big one is that you can control noise. Once you get a digital signal, if you wish to expand the effort, you can really preserve that data. You can back it up. You can do all sorts of things. We talked about that already. Uh, the other really powerful advantage is that you can typically reprogram it and you can have a programmable hardware that can that can be uh, super flexible, multi-purpose. And that, that multi-purpose allows you then to make a whole lot of things and then use them for a myriad of different uh, 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 products. And uh, certainly that's true with embedded controllers. And then our mathematical uh, operations can have an arbitrary level of precision limited strictly by how many bits you're gonna devote to the actual calculations. And, uh, and also, m most of the time in a digital system, the inputs are related to the outputs in a very deterministic way. Now, when you're using a desktop computer, because it's super complex uh, and it has bugs in it, uh, we still can get, you know, blue, you know, uh, the death, the, the blue screen death. Uh, a application can just totally crash because you pushed three buttons or did something that was never anticipated by the programmers, and there's a bug, and so, bam. So, so still unexpected things happen, but they're they're still actually programmed in. If you did the exact same things, uh, you would probably get the exact same blue screen of death. All right. Analog has all sorts of disadvantages. Noise, again, is the biggest one. Super inflexible. When you want to change an analog system, you can't just change uh, some firmware or software. You have to rebuild a, a new system. And um, often in your analog system, when you do analog math, I mean, we don't do analog math anymore, but, but back when we did, uh, after two or three calculations, because you, you would the, the inaccuracies would be compounded, uh, you couldn't do very complex calculations and have any precision left at all. All right, uh, so again, it, logic design really deals with sort of this concept. We have a switching network here. It may be a combinational network, maybe a sequential network. We have some number of inputs, we have some number of outputs. And, and, uh, and for a combinational network, the outputs are strictly determined by the current inputs, but for a sequential network, we also use the current inputs plus some state that the network is in, which represents uh, some memory about prior inputs or where it is in, in a process. All right, and that just says the same thing we just said. Um, 
So we typically use a truth table. And this just gives uh, a list of all the independent variables and then the desire and then the expected or desired uh, values of the dependent variables. And we, um, we can implement this using uh, min terms and max terms. We use the min terms on the rows that have a desired output of one. We use the max terms on the rows with a desired output of zero. Either way, we, we wind up with the exact, uh, we wind up with equivalent expressions, but one will be in SOP form and one will be in POS form. And then we basically simplify these things using K-maps or switching algebra or whatever. And then if you want, you can take your, your POS or SOP expression and you can implement it directly in a two-layer hardware net. Uh, initially, we, we did most things with AND gates and OR gates. Uh, SOP has an input layer of AND gates and an output OR gate. POS has an input of OR gates and an output of AND gates. And then later we, sh we saw how we could, uh, we could uh, start with either SOP or POS and manipulate it into other forms. Most notably, our SOP form could go to AND AND, uh, sorry, NAND NAND, and our POS form could go to NOR NOR. And then there were there were uh, four other uh, options as well for a total of eight different two-layer networks. And there are actually even more things than that, uh, but that's a good start. If you just use uh, AND gates, OR gates, NAND gates, and NOR gates, uh, then there are eight different uh, combinations that, that, will, um, that will implement any logic function. All right, now in, in our digital system, we, we have sort of imposed this, this two-state rule. Uh, it is getting pushed around a little bit now because uh, now we have uh, NVIDIA's latest device apparently is using some four-state logic uh, in, its, uh, in some of its uh, memory. And we already know that a bunch of our flash memory is three and four-state um, capable. So uh, we, this, this may change, but for the short term, all of the real processing, all of the, all of the math processing, all the CPU stuff, and all that is all still uh, two-state devices. But the memory has changed a little bit, and we are now squeezing uh, four different states in our memory cells. Um, but the logic's still being done as two-state because all our design method and tools are set up for, for the binary world. All of our gates, our AND gates and OR gates, those are based on, on two-state thinking. And if you suddenly created four states, that's, that's going to really change the rules a lot. And, and it's going to be interesting to see if maybe in the next, you know, 10, 15 years, we, something like that happens. I don't know. It, it, it'll be surprising, but I think it, down the road at some point it will happen, but maybe more like 25 years or whatever. All right. So we have all sorts of physical devices, uh, and in most of these cases, our outputs are always defined at two different voltage levels. In the old days, uh, our transistor-to-transistor -transistor logic, so-called TTL, was always a five volt uh, family. Zero volts was a zero and five volts was a one. But uh, in the interest of uh, decreasing power and heat generation uh, and allowing denser chips to be made, uh, we've now moved down to much lower voltages with lots of 3.3 devices, lots of 1.8 volt devices, 1.2 volts, and uh, there's I ease in some maybe sub one volt. Um, so, of course, this suggests binary numbers, and that's why we use binary numbers. Binary numbers are, of course, base two number system. Um, they do have a special relationship to octal and hex, and for that matter, also base four and base twelve. But, but we used to use octal a lot, not anymore. So pretty much now, the three bases that are uh, important are ba are binary, hex, and decimal. Hex and binary are directly related. You just group four bits and that forms one hex digit. Uh, but decimal does not go cleanly into uh, a, a specific number of, of, uh, of binary bits uh, because uh, 10, there's no, uh, 10 is not a power of two, so that's a problem. And so there takes a little bit of conversion and you all learned how to do that. Uh, obviously now you'd probably use your calculators, uh, but, uh, it's good to it's good to remember and um, every base is based on the same idea. You have a base. In the case of decimal, our, our base is ten. 
So if our base is 10 or 2 or 16, that's how many symbols we need to represent numbers in that base. So for base 10, we need 10 symbols. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There is no symbol for 10. It takes two symbols, a 1 and a 0. Um, but we do have 10 symbols. Is it 1 through 9 plus 0? That's the same in hex. We have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, and remember, you have to deal with lowercase and uppercase A, B, C, D, E, F, which is a little confusing, and, um, but that's where we are. Uh, the, uh, um, yeah, in binary, of course, we just have 0 and 1. Uh, we start at the point. We call this in decimal system the decimal point, but obviously in binary, it would be the binary point. In hex, it would be the hex point. So normally we sort of changing our verbiage to just say point these days. So you start at the point, you move left with increasing powers of two, two sorry. <coughs> you move left with increasing powers of the base, which in this case is 10, and the first power is zero. So uh, you move to the right with increasing, with decreasing powers, and the first power is minus one and then minus two. In this case, 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two. So that would be seven tenths, eight one hundredths. Three times one are three. Five times 10 are 50. Nine times 10 squared are 900. And that's how this base works. And so when you add these things up, you get the number. Of course, you're adding it up in decimal and this is how you would write it. So it's sort of um, begs the question, I guess. But in base two, that's a little different. We really can, you know, then we have to kind of calculate them. Uh, and in hex, same thing. But then we're using powers of 16. So, um, yeah, like this. So in hex, A32 is 10 times 16 squared, 3 times 16 to the first, and 2 times 16 to the zero power. So, um, so 3 times, so 2, 3 times, plus 3 times 16, plus uh, 10 times 16 squared. All right, uh, native numbers. So there are there are multiple systems uh, ha that were proposed, but universally two's complement is the winners, and that's what almost er that's that's really what all digital logic uses. I, there must be some exceptions, but for the most part, that's it. And the reason why uh, is because two's complement really works cleaner and better when you try and implement it in hardware. The sine and magnitude and the ones complement have, both have this problem of two representations for zero. And that just isn't going to get it because then you have to go to extra special trouble to deal with the, the two representations for zero. In two's complement, that doesn't happen. You only have one representation for zero. And uh, so that, that makes it very helpful. All right, let me... Um, I might just show that. I'll, I'll um, we'll do this, and then I'll switch the camera. Uh, I might try it. Well, I won't try it right now. Oh, I don't even have it turned on. So there we go. Okay, and then we'll do a light. Oh, I see. Uh, Hmm. Let's do this again. Try this again. Okay. Yeah. Now it's not a. Now it's out of focus. Figures, right? But anyway. Okay. So. So I was going to show you. Um, how this two representations, uh, how, why two's complement only has one representation for zero. Now you remember when we do math in two's complement, we ignore carry outs, right? So, so here's, here's, this is kind of cute, but so let's take, let's take, uh, we'll take eight bits of zero, okay? Okay, that equals zero. That's our binary representation in two's complement for zero. Um, here it is in base 10. Now, let's say, uh, so let's say we want to uh, convert 0 
uh, to a negative zero in two's complement, which which you really can't do, but maybe you could. So we'll take we we'll use the method that we've learned and see what happens. And um, I think you'll see it's kind of kind of interesting. Let's see if I can do this. And then I'm going to move it down. Maybe it's a little better focused. I don't know. Maybe not. All right. So anyway, so remember the rule. Uh, you invert every bit and add one. That's one rule. So if we invert every bit and we add one, what do we get? Well, zero carry one, 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 zero carry one. But that one you carry out is ignored because in two's complement math we ignore carry outs. So you get right back to zero. There's only one representation. And so that's 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 cool. And that really makes two's complement much more usable um, than it would be if that weren't true. Um, all right. All right, continuing. So that's why we don't use. However, I will say that the IEEE 754 standard, which is actually just under God revision uh, for floating point numbers, uh, uh, and we're going to talk about that extensively, so I'm not going to mention it here uh, later on in the course, but it does use a, uh, a sign bit. So it is kind of a sign magnitude um, representation. But it also has an exponential field and a mantissa field, and it's a uh, and it's uh, normalized, and we leave out uh, at least one of the bits, and so it's, it's pretty complicated. All right, so we're not going to talk about one's complement, but all that is, you just invert every bit. Two's complement, you invert every bit and add one, or you, starting from the right, you copy bits until you get to the first one, copy that, and then invert every other bit. So in our other example, since there were no ones, uh, we just copied all the zeros and we're done. Um, all right. Now, how do we do, since we ignore the overflow bit in two's complement math, how do we know if we're overflowing? Well, that's really a good question. Uh, and the way that, that we do that is, if we add two positives in two's complement, then we, we should not get a negative result. And if we do, we overflowed. If we add two negatives, we should not get a positive result. And if we do, we overflowed. Now, what about if you add a positive and a negative? Turns out, in that scenario, you it is impossible to get an overflow. So you don't have to worry about it. So what you do is you check the two add-ins, or the add-in, or the two subject hands, or whatever, the whatever. Um, and you uh, make sure if they're the same sign that the answer matches. And uh, many times this is done in hardware and many micros, and they put an extra bit in the status word called the V bit, which uh, which is the two's complement overflow bit. And I think I think we have it here. Notice when we do math with two's complement, we ignore the carries. But in one's complement, you have to do end the round carries. You have to add the carry back in to the lower bits. It's just terrible. Uh, so two's complement is just a lot easier. Um, all right, binary codes. Well, so most of you know about ASCII representations for letters. Uh, it turns out we have a whole bunch of other representations too. Um, we have Unicode, which even now includes emojis and a whole bunch of other stuff, but it represents all the Chinese uh, and, and Japanese uh, characters and all the special characters in all the other languages, including things like Sanskrit and Arabic and I don't know what all, uh, and, and, um, and Hebrew and Greek and you name it, and Russian. Uh, so, so I think eventually, you know, everybody will use uh, Unicode, but for the moment, um, a lot of stuff we still do, especially with embedded uh, processors and in, 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 in FPGA programs in the U.S., we're still using a lot of ASCII just because it's simple and it's been around forever. Um, so uh, we have other types of codes too besides just codes to represent letters. We have uh, codes that be computed. Uh, in the old days, we did a lot of binary coded decimal. Uh, not so much anymore. Mostly nowadays, all the, all the bin all the math is just done in straight binary, and except floating point, of course, we still use uh, we still use the uh, the IEEE 754 standard, but um, but we convert it to two's complement when we actually do the calculations. Um, 
gray codes. So uh, uh, you know the classic place for gray code is a, is a shaft encoder. And the reason why we want to use gray codes is because we only, if we, have, if we allow more than one bit to change, if we're right in between where all the bits are going to change, or more than one bit is going to change, we have uncertainty in, in several bits. And uh, if all the bits change, we have uncertainty in every bit, at least at that point we do. And since that point is part of our uh, part of all of our points, uh, it it in introduces uncertainty, uh, complete uncertainty into the problem, which is really terrible. So obviously we only want one bit to change at a time. The only problem is it's not a computational code. So in order to figure out how it works, we have to use a uh, we have to use a lookup table, and uh, we have to have a list of the gray codes, and then we have to match those to the binary ordered codes so that we can actually uh, calculate the, the angles. Um, we have fault tolerant codes. Uh, the classic of these is the parity code where we can do odd parity or even parity. Uh, we used to use these all the time when we had dial up modems uh, and noisy lines and we, 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 we would use parity and you had to, you know, you had to look up and see were they using uh, odd parity or even parity and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's kind of gone away because um, we will typically send a lot of data and maybe send a uh, cyclic redundancy check at the end. And then if that's good, you know all the data was good. If that's bad, then you know somewhere you got a bad, a bad bit. So then you have to send it all again. Um, there are some fault tolerant codes that send enough additional extra bits that you can uh, correct a, 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 a several bit error. Um, and so, so there are some self-correcting codes. Um, all right, here's our shaft encoders. Notice here, th this is only a three bit one, but notice all three bits change right at this point. So if, is as the shaft goes around and you have photocells reading these three, uh, you have three photocells reading these three lanes, uh, you, you get to a point as it rotates where all three bits become uncertain. You have uncertainty in all three bits. So that means you don't know, you, so your actual readout could put you any place you know, on the entire, uh, uh, in any one of these quadrants, or not quadrants, but half quadrant. And so that's, that means there could be a point here where you don't know where you are. That's uncertainty in every bit. That's terrible. Uh, and here's an example where uh, uh, it's even a bigger shaft encoder with more bits, I guess, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different bits. But notice, look, a whole bunch of them change here at the exact same time. So that's not good either. But then, uh, I think uh, I took the other one out. Anyway, so we, we, do want, we do want shaft encoders that are gray coded. All right. Uh, I'm not going to say much about BCD. Uh, it, it, when, back when our memory was, our program memory was limited on better controllers, we used it a lot because uh, if you only need to do a little bit of math, you could do it in BCD and it would save you uh, the 40 lines of code to convert a decimal number to a binary number and the 40 lines of code it would take to convert it back out. And that's 80 lines of code. And if you only had 300 lines of code um, that you could use, uh, that was a big chunk. And so what you would do, you'd, you'd do it in BCD where you could get by with a lot less code uh, and still do some easy math. Now, what you, you know, you couldn't do, couldn't do super complicated calculations and so for that reason um, you know it was limiting but um, nowadays it's so much easier to do the math in C we just use C and we we take the hit because we have bigger program memories um, okay ASCII codes we talked about this already now uh, I do want to mention fonts I'm not going to talk about the old IBM IBCDIC code uh, but fonts are, are really important to understand when when you send a, a character to the screen, or you send it to a printer, now you're not now you're not just specifying which one of the 128 characters it is. You're you're telling it how it's supposed to look, and when you're describing the looks of a character, it takes more information than seven bits. Uh, it takes uh, a number of bytes potentially, and some of these fonts are scalable. Some of them aren't. The true type and the postscript uh, fonts are scalables. Uh, but there were printer fonts that weren't scalable. You don't see that much anymore. I think we're almost all always using scalable fonts now. But in the old days, if you tried to scale up a non-scalable font, it would start to look really terrible as it got bigger. Or, and maybe 
not so good as it got too small too. Couldn't couldn't even discern it. Um, these uh, so these uh, these fonts require a number of bytes, whereas the ASCII codes require um, seven bits, and that's that's why it left room. An eighth bit was a perfect for a, a parity bit. Boolean algebra. So when you just have two values, we call it switching algebra. It's just a special case of Boolean. And uh, our switching algebra expressions translate directly into hardware. And uh, in the old days, we would implement them with discrete gates. Just, you know, we'd buy a chip with four, you know, three input NAND gates or something, and we'd just uh, hook, up the, hook up the AND gates or the NAND gates. Nowadays, though, we're going to fabricate these on an integrated circuit using a hardware description language, or we're going to generate a bit file using a hardware description language like we are in DSD. Okay, remember that, that in this context, 0 and 1 are really true and false, not, not numbers. They, do, they are represented by voltage levels, but they don't represent the value 1 and the value 0, such that if you added uh, three ones, you get 3, because there is no such thing as 3. It's just, you know, if you and three ones together, you get a one as an output. If you are two zeros and a one together, you get a one as an output. All right, so they're really symbols, not numbers. Okay, we talked about truth tables. This is our gold standard, and this is how we follow our design process. And in, an, in, an, in, an, in, a, in a logic expression, uh, we have variables, literals, and operators in constants. And um, every appearance of a variable is called a literal. All right. And um, yeah, I took out the rest of that. All right, truth tables. Uh, so we have, we have some number of independent variables. Let's say we have n independent variables. If we, have, if we do, then we have two to the n rows. So if we have three independent variables and say one output function, then we have eight rows. And we typically specify the output function for every input combination that's going to occur. And if every input combination can occur, then that's a completely specified truth table. But if on the other hand, um, there are some input combinations that will never occur, then that gives you some don't cares for the output, which means uh, that you can pick what you want F to be to simplify your, your logic expressions and maybe to reduce your hardware. Now, if you're going to implement it on an, on an FPGA, it doesn't matter because uh, the FPGA, uh, at least ours, uses LUT6s. So if you have a six variable truth table, you just map the entire uh, desired output for F straight into the LUT6 in the, in the FPGA. All right, um, so here's, a, here's an example. How many variables and literals in the following expression? And how many terms? Okay, so how many variables? Well, you have A, B, and C. How many literals? Every appearance of A, B, or C is a literal. So you have 3 plus 2, that's 5, plus 3, that's 8, plus 2, that's 10. How many terms? So that's a little confusing. But basically, you have an AND gate here, an AND gate there, an AND gate there, and an AND gate there. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4 gates. Okay? And so that's the number of terms. But you also have an output OR gate. So do you count the whole thing as one big term? Normally we don't. Uh, it is, but we don't normally count it that way. So we would say four terms. But we have one expression composed of four terms. So three variables, ten literals, four terms, one expression. Okay, and here's what it looks like. Uh, this should be pretty straightforward. Now we have to pay attention. If we, if we take something like this, but we put parentheses on it differently, it totally changes the circuit and the output, and it's logic. It's not the same anything. So you always have to remember order precedence and use parentheses liberally to make it very clear what you intend. All right. Now, we also have uh, operations with, uh, we have our basic theorems. And you guys have seen this. I'm not going to go through it all, but... Um, Let's see. Oh, I thought I had the chart coming up. Uh, I guess I do. Well, the, some of the key ones here are the first distributive law and the second distributive law. And then the... Uh, so, let's see. So, um, 
So we, we, we like to have these two, we, we have defined two canonical forms for logic expressions, SOP and POS. Now, it turns out that's not the only way to do switching algebra. Uh, there are other canonical systems that have been developed, including uh, AND gates and exclusive OR gates or something. So you could theoretically do that, but, uh, but classically, these are the two canonical forms. The sum of products has a set of input AND gates. Each term is an input AND gate, and then there's one output OR gate. And the canonical POS form has a, a some number of input OR gates. Each term is an input OR, or gate. And then the whole expression uh, goes into one output AND gate. And um, so to be in canonical form, all the, all the terms have to be essentially AND gates. Uh, here you have, you have an OR gate embedded in this uh, as a, an input to this AND gate. So you have a three layer net here and it's not in canonical form. All right, um, single variables are okay. And I'm not gonna go through this anymore. Uh, that should be pretty straightforward. So here's a classic SOP form, three input AND gates, one output OR gate. This has two inputs, these both have three. This has three. Okay. So anyway, so, and this is the POS. Notice here we have one, two, three uh, input OR gates and an output AND gate. These all happen to have two inputs, but there's no, there's no rule about how many inputs you can have, uh, except that there is a physically realizable um, limit uh, just based on the uh, capacitance, the parasitic capacitance and inductance, and you want to keep the propagation delay times at a reasonable level. So, you know, so like a, an AND gate with 100 inputs, and it's not going to happen. In fact, I don't know, probably, probably much more than six or seven is getting, is pushing it. All right, so here are all the theorems. You guys should be familiar with this, uh, although I'm not going to give you any really difficult uh, uh, switching algebra problems. I do, you know, I might ask you some simple things. Uh, you should be able to do some simple switching algebra. So you should go back and review a few of those things. Okay, inversion. We should know about De Morgan's laws, and the key to De Morgan's laws is uh, that we invert the variables. To invert a, a, an expression, we invert all the variables and we invert the operator. So here's this is an OR gate with x and y in. So we turn it into an AND gate with x prime and y prime in. Here we have x and y going into an AND gate, and we if we invert that, we turn it into x prime and y prime going into an OR gate. Notice that this is not true. And a lot of students want to think it's true, but it's not. X, Y does not e, is not the inverse of X prime, Y prime. It would be X prime plus Y prime. You have to invert that AND operator also. Okay. Uh, when you use De Morgan's Laws, use parentheses liberally so you keep track of everything and don't make a, a, an order of precedence mistake. So here you have a prime plus b, that quantity times c prime. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to change the, this is c prime anded with the output of this OR gate. So you're going to change that into an OR gate, but you're going to change this OR gate into an AND gate and invert all the variables. And if you're not careful, then you can wind up with, uh, uh, well, in this case, it's okay because you wind up with a b prime plus c. That's easy. But if you go the other direction, then you can wind up with, a prime plus BC or something, or BC prime. All right, we're not going to talk. I I don't really care about dual, and I uh, it, the the dual is. I don't think it's used that much anymore. Um, it was a little more important in the old days when people would do lots of designs with logic gates, and for some reason, some groups would do their design um, in uh, in negative logic, and uh, other group other parts of the same group of the same project but a different group might do theirs in positive logic and then they would have to marry them up by by taking the dual of the negative logic so it would become positive logic. So that's kind of how it's been used. Um, it also is used to, to form all our paired theorems but it's not something that um, it's not something that we're going to really deal with. Um, if f equals g then 
f prime equals g prime and, f, and the dual of f equals the dual of g but it is not necessarily the case that f, f should never equal f prime about the dual that's a little more confusing uh, I suppose it might be possible that it could equal the dual I don't know I, I guess it shouldn't but the definition of the dual is you invert the operators but you don't invert the variables Okay, the consensus theorem. So you should remember from uh, logic design using your k-maps how you could easily see the consensus theorem and how it was a little tough to see it uh, like this. But obviously xy plus x prime z, so that makes yz the consensus term. And here it is. You don't need that term. You can just drop it, and that's still equally valid. However, uh, we know that uh, hazards can arise because we don't include that consensus term. So sometimes we'll go back and add a consensus term just to uh, avoid a little uh, glitch uh, when we, if we switch from one critical state to a different one, uh, which the consensus term would have covered. All right, uh, we have three rules for simplification plus the consensus term, making it four. We have the ability to combine terms. This is what we used extensively in our k-maps. xy plus xy prime equals x. We eliminate terms x plus xy equals x. And then we eliminate the literal. x plus x prime y equals xy. This x prime literal gets dropped out. You don't lose the whole term because you still have to have the y. But the x prime you can leave out. And that's easy to understand. If x is 0, then this will be 1. So it just becomes y. And if x is 1, then this x already uh, rules the day. It doesn't matter what y is. Uh, so it really just becomes xy. Um, sometimes you can do really tricky things. You can add, you can add a consensus term, and then you can uh, delete other ones. But the k-map sort of removes all this playing around. Because with the k-map, your visual system allows you to instantly see the optimum solution, or at least after you look at it for a minute, you can see it. Multiplying and factoring theorem. This is a very important. So the main, the two, the, the two biggest, uh, three biggest theorems for switching algebra, what, besides the simplification theorems and the basic identities, are the first distributive law, the second distributive law, and the multiplying and factoring theorem. Um, all right. Exclusive R. So you should know this quite well. Uh, if you have two ones, it's a zero. Otherwise, a single one is a one, and two, of course, two zeros would be a zero. Now, what happens when you have three? And when you have three, what happens is, and I don't know if I have that, uh, when you have three, uh, then it, it, if you have two ones in a row, then you output a zero. If you just have one one, you output a, you output a, a one. And if you have no ones, you output a zero. What if you have three ones? And the answer is, if you have three ones, you output a one. So that's a little confusing, but that's how it is. So you can say, in some ways, it's not an exclusive or it's a, it's kind of a, it's it's an it's an odd gate. Maybe is a better way to put it. The equivalence gate is can also be called a XNOR gate, and uh, it's exactly equivalent to the uh, to the OR gate, uh, to sorry to the exclusive OR gate, except you invert the output. Okay, um, so we can we can take a truth table and we can implement it with SOP or POS. If we have don't cares, then then we can uh, try and take advantage of them to improve our ability to simplify the resulting equation. And uh, so here's an example. Uh, you should know this. So you just take you would take these these five rows here, a, all the min terms for these rows. So a prime b c plus a b prime c prime plus a b prime c plus a b c prime plus a b c. And then you could simplify it as best you could. Um, here's the uh, max term, the quantity a plus b plus c times the quantity a plus b plus c prime times the quantity a plus b prime plus c. And you multiply those three terms together, and that gives you the max term solution in SOP form, uh, sorry, POS form. So. Here they are, min term solution, max term solution. These should be equal for the same problem. All right, we, our abbreviation, shorthand abbreviation, we use a little sum sign for the SOP for the min terms, and then we just write them, a lot of times we'll write an M, and then we'll write 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 
And for the max terms, we use the multiplication sign. We do it like this, the big M and 0, 1, 2. Uh, for the other one, we would have done the sum sign of the little m and then the, the, the indexes that, that are represented. In this case, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right. Um, so when we have incomplete, in, incompletely specified functions, we can choose the don't cares uh, in a way that makes our solution smaller if we choose to do that. Um, all right. Uh, remember, we've learned design by iteration. And uh, so what we do here, instead of designing this adder, because we had uh, four bits of A, four bits of B, and a carry in, so nine independent variables, five output variables, four bits of sum and a carry out. Because of that, uh, that design uh, could actually take quite a while. Um, it could, it, it, you know, it would have 512 rows. So you, you could spend a lot of time getting that sorted out. So an easier way to do it is design a, a complete one bit adder with uh, uh, one input of A, one input of B, one carry in, one sum output, and a one carry out. And then you just daisy chain those together like this. And it's a whole lot easier to do that. And uh, the design looks like, uh, I thought I had it written out. Well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah, I should have. Um, okay, I, I guess I never wrote that out, or if I did, I deleted that slide. Okay, remember we talked about two's complement math. Here's the here's how you calculate the v bit. You compare the high order bits in the two inputs with the sum, and it should never be true that the two inputs are the opposite of the sum. So a three prime, b three prime, and s three. If that's one, you overflowed. And A3, B3, S3 prime, if that's one, you overflowed. So that's how you calculate it. And like I said, many, many processors do this in hardware so that you have this bit directly available to you. Um, okay, subtractor, all we do is put a one in. So basically we invert, say if we're going to subtract uh, B from A, we invert B, all four bits of B, and we add a one to the carry in, so that's that's inverting, inverting B and adding one. That makes B a two complement. And then we just add it to, to A, and that effectively subtracts it. And it, it works great. And that's why two's complement is so popular. Uh, Queen and McCluskey, so you remember, uh, so we did uh, we did K-maps and Queen and McCluskey. Um, yeah, we kind of jumped along. I don't know, somewhere we skipped K-maps here. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, I see. It's a big. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Did we not? Did we not do? Yeah, I guess we didn't really cover. I, I didn't. For some reason, I didn't put K maps in the uh, <laughs> in the review. Well, let me just say I, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, K maps, and I'll come back to Queenie McCluskey because. So, so remember, you remember the K maps. You should just write, do a few K maps. Make sure you can still do a K map. Three variable, four variable K maps. You should be able to plot terms and read terms, um, and you should be able. If I gave you a four variable expression, you should be able to put it in a K map, and then read out the put in the ones and read out the zeros to convert an SOP to a POS form, or vice versa. We can use them to to show that two things are equivalent. We can convert from one form to another. There's a lot of uses, but the primary use of a K map is to simplify. Uh, our SOP or POS logic expressions. Um, okay, I think with that I'm going to stop uh, and then we'll pick up and uh, continue the march uh, on Wednesday. And like I said, we'll keep going and then next, uh, I think it was next Wednesday, we'll, we'll have the, the review test on logic design. All right.